There it is. Philippians chapter 4, verse 10 through 19. Uh, I tell you, I am glad that John assigned me for this week and not next week, because I'm looking at what he has to preach on next week, starting in verse 21. It's all just greetings. I'll let that to the seasoned preacher to pull truth out of those verses. Uh, I will gladly take verses 10 through 19 this week. But at, before I read this, I want us just to, I want you to picture in your mind whatever, whatever you think Paul looked like, conjure him up in your mind. I want us to picture him in his prison cell, in his imprisonment. I want you to picture him looking off into the corner at the stack of supplies that the Philippian church has given him. And as he looks at that supply and he thinks about how he wants to end his letter, he just looks at that gift. And this is what he writes, starting in verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet, it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied having received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Father, as we have our Bibles open, our minds are, are in many different places. We're distracted by many things. But the most needful thing right now, Lord, is for you to speak to us. We didn't come here to hear the words of a man. We came here to hear your voice speaking through your word. So we, we pray against the sin in our own minds that would keep us from really giving attention to these passages. We pray against the evil one who would seek to distract us. Help us to focus our minds on your truth and to learn more of who Jesus is as we pray in his name. Amen. I want you to imagine that you have a missionary friend who is uh, doing missions work in a closed country, in a place where the gospel is not allowed to be shared. And I want you to imagine that it's been discovered that he's a missionary, and he has suffered persecution, he's been thrown into prison. And you discover in his imprisonment that he is not given any food, he's not given any water, none of his basic necessities are being provided for him. So you and a couple of friends here from church, you get together, you put together a bundle of a care package for him, and you send it off in some hopes of a miracle that maybe this care package will be delivered into his care. And you wait and you wait, maybe a few months pass, and finally a letter comes in the mail, and it's from your friend. He's giving you some updates on how he's doing. It doesn't seem like, it doesn't seem like maybe he's received the care package that you gave him. And finally, at the very end of the letter, he just writes something and he says, by the way, I thank God for your concern for me. I didn't need what you gave me, but it was kind. Sign, missionary's name. How would you feel about that? You went out of your way to get this guy some supplies and he says, eh, thanks, but I didn't really need it. Would you feel confused? Would you feel like maybe your friend's being a little rude? Would you be offended maybe even a little bit? What is going on? Because that is essentially what Paul is doing in these verses. Here he is. He's an imprisoned 
missionary who has been uh, persecuted for sharing the gospel. He's in a prison, and the only way he's going to get his basic necessities is by someone coming along and graciously providing them for them. The, the Philippians go out of their way to give him these supplies, and he says thank you, but in kind of an awkward way. In fact, one of the commentaries that I read this week called this text Paul's thankless thank you. What's going on with Paul's talking here about the gift that the Philippians gave? Well, Paul is thankful. Of course he's thankful for the gift. But he's using the opportunity to reveal a secret, a secret about life that you and I so desperately need to discover. And it's the secret of contentment. Paul is letting us in on the secret of contentment. Take a look at verse 12. In verse 12, he says in the second sentence, In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. We could go to a bookstore today. We could pull out a bunch of books, spend a lot of money on learning about the secrets of contentment. Paul gives it to us this morning for free, and he condenses it to just a sentence. You and I are going to discover what that secret is this morning, and we're also going to discover what happens when we become content, how our giving begins to change. So two things we're going to see from this text this morning. One, the secret of contentment, and two, the standards of giving. The secret of contentment and the standards of giving. First, the secret to contentment. Now, Paul is not going to let us in on the secret right away. He's going to make us do a little digging. We need to do a little bit of learning before Paul lets us in on the secret. So we got to always have to dig before you get to the buried treasure. So take out your shovels. we got to learn a lesson. There is a lesson that Paul wants us to learn that he had to learn himself before he lets us in on what this secret to contentment is. And what is the lesson? The lesson is this. Contentment is not dependent on our circumstances. Contentment is not dependent on our circumstances. Take a look at verse 11. Verse 11, Paul is talking about, uh, in verse 10 rather, he, he thanks the Philippians for their gift. And then in verse 11 he says, not that I am speaking of being in need. You just want to stop there and say, what are you talking about, Paul? You're in a prison and none of your basic necessities are being provided. He says, no, I'm not speaking of being in need. For what? He learned a lesson. What was the lesson? I have learned in whatever situation, I am to be content. His contentment did not matter upon his circumstances. You and I, we are really bad at being contentment, uh, at being content. Um, how many of you have been watching The Chosen? Any of you? Oh, good. More hands than the first service. That's good. Um, there is a reason why the minute that the, that the next episode comes out, I am eagerly waiting, impatiently, for the next episode to come out. Because they're not coming out in, in like normal time frame. It's not a weekly thing. It's just as they finish them, they're bringing them out. And that just goes to show, why, why do we get so anxious about our favorite TV show, the next episode coming out? Because we're never content. And oh, how we give in to all those advertisements bombarding us day in and day out, trying to convince us that our wants are really our needs. You need that new iPhone. You need that brand new car. You need that new shiplap on your wall or whatever's trendy these days. Too often, we live our Christian lives as functional materialists. We're not content. I was thinking this week of my own personal life, how I thought there were going to be things in this world that would give me ultimate contentment that ultimately let me down. Uh, when, I, when I was dating my wife, Hannah, I had the crazy idea that most young men have when they fall head over heels in love, that marriage was going to solve all my problems. It was going to be the ultimate satisfaction. I'll finally be satisfied when I get married. Well, it didn't take long into marriage to realize it is one of the greatest joys in life, but it doesn't fulfill you. And then I thought, well, maybe, maybe the dream job, full-time ministry, maybe that will be the mark of final satisfaction. Well, I've been working here almost a decade. 
and it hasn't really changed my identity that much. Still desires that aren't fulfilled. What about you? Would you call yourself a truly content person? Paul learned contentment did not depend on his circumstances, and he was a work in progress. Notice again in verse 11, he doesn't say, I have learned in whatever situation I am content. No, he says, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. He needed to learn the lesson, and so do we. Paul learned the hard way that that the temptation to be discontent comes on either sides of the scale of abundance or need. Notice in verse 12, he says, I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. He said he had to learn the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. There was issues of contentment on both sides. When he was in desperate need, he needed to learn how to be content. And when he had all his needs met, when life was going really well, even then he needed to learn how to be content. What Paul is saying is, if you're here this morning, you're down deep in the pits of life. Maybe you're in massive debt. You've got a crummy job. Maybe you're suffering serious illness. Or you've lost a loved one. Paul's secret to contentment doesn't require your circumstance to improve in order to reach contentment. Maybe you're here this morning and you're abounding. Everything's good. Bank account looks great. Family life, good. Life, you you don't have any complaints. Paul is saying your situation doesn't need to stay the same in order for you to truly experience contentment. The proverb writer lets us in on the danger that comes from uh, either extreme of poverty or abundant riches. I'd love for us to read this off the screen together. Let's read this. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I steal and profane the name of God. See what the proverb writer is saying there? He's saying, Lord, don't give me so much that I'm no longer dependent on you and I forget you. And don't give me so little that I begin to curse you and question your goodness of provision. The lesson we learn first before we get in on the secret is that true contentment is not dependent on our circumstances. So then, Paul, what is the secret? What's the secret to contentment? Well, in verse 12 and verse 13, he tells us. Verse 12, he says, In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And here's the secret. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This week, for whatever reason, this is how my brain works when I'm doing sermon prep. I imagine myself sitting on a park bench with Paul. He's an old man, and he just looks at me and he says, son, you know, I've learned the secret to being content. And I ask him, what is it? And he leans in, and he just whispers, verse 13 to me, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. See, this is a very popular verse for us. We quote it all the time, but oftentimes when we quote it, we're quoting it with the exact opposite meaning that Paul is intending. We say things like, I'm going to be the next uh, Olympic athlete because I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I'm going to be a millionaire by 2025 because I can do all things through him who strengthens me. No, in context, Paul is saying, when I am hungry and I have nothing, I have learned I can face it and be content through him who strengthens me. The secret to contentment, when we trust in Christ's sufficiency, you will know contentment. Trust in Christ's sufficiency and you will know contentment. Where did Paul find his contentment? Not in the things of this world, but outside this world. Notice the language in verse 12. It's all earthly things. Plenty, hunger, abundance, need. Those are all things of this world. He says, where do I find my strength? Where do I find my satisfaction and contentment? I find it 
in God, in Christ, who is outside this world, who is up in the heavens, who is ruling over all this as Lord of lords, King of kings. That is where I find my ultimate satisfaction. How many of you have read Mere Christianity? Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And one of the passages there, he talks about how there are these desires within our lives that just never can be satisfied. I mean, there are some things in life you can satisfy here. If you're hungry, there's food. If, there, if you're thirsty, there's drink. But what about those deep inner longings that we just can't seem to get filled? C.S. Lewis writes in Mere Christianity about those unfulfilled longings. He says, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. You and I were made for another world. We were made to be in the world of eternity, to be with Christ who is all satisfying, the greatest treasure of life as we sang. And Jesus is sufficient to satisfy all our greatest needs. He alone in all this world and all that there is to be on offer and to take in, he alone is what brings true contentment. All we need to do is scan through the verses that we've already looked at to see the ways in which he answers our deepest longings and satisfies our deepest needs. I mean, for instance, we see from Philippians that Jesus satisfies our sense of guilt and shame, that acknowledgement that we are not what we are supposed to be, that we are sinners, that we have done wrong, that we have not loved God or people the way that we should. Paul talks about this in chapter 3, verse 9. He says, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, that is, not my own know-how and goodness, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. In Christ, we find a righteousness that takes care of our deep guilt and shame, a perfect righteousness that belongs to us through faith in him. He satisfies our need for sympathy and suffering. Those moments in life where you're absolutely going through awful situations, loss, grief, whatever it may be, and you look around and you say, who understands? Who can sympathize? In Jesus, we find that. In chapter 2, verse 8, we saw that he, Christ, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. In Jesus, we have a God who understands the human experience firsthand. He went through it. Never can we tell God, God, you just don't get it. You don't understand. Yes, he does. He went through the utmost agony, the utmost trial, the utmost temptation, and came out victorious. And he comes to us in our suffering with compassion and wisdom and guidance. And he satisfies our hope for eternal life. All of us want to escape death. All of us want to come out of death alive, well, thriving. And in Jesus, we have that. Chapter 3, 10 and 11, Paul says that I may know Jesus and the power of his resurrection, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Where do we find ultimate contentment in this life? Not here below, but in Christ. Trust in Christ's sufficiency, and you will know contentment. St. Augustine said it this way, our hearts are restless until they rest in him. If you are here this morning and you don't know Jesus, I ask you, what, what does he have to do to prove, what more would he have to do to prove that he is the ultimate satisfaction to all the longings that your soul has? Place your trust in him. He alone will give you the contentment that you're seeking in this weary world. We're, we're all with you here. We're sick and weary of this broken, fallen world. It's a good world, but it's broken, and it doesn't satisfy. But Jesus satisfies. In him is perfect contentment. So we see the secret of contentment. And notice, what happens when we're content? 
When we're content, the things of this world begin to fade away in their importance, and we're more likely to give. We're likely to give away the things of this world. We just don't have a tight grip on them anymore. We hold them with an open hand. And when Jesus is our ultimate contentment, we want to give all we can to further his work, for his glory, for the proclamation of the gospel. So that takes us to our second point, the standards of giving. The standards of giving. In uh, verses 14 through 19, we learn some lessons from the Philippian church on what it looks like to be good givers, to give to gospel work, to kingdom work. Uh, There are four that I want to draw our attention to from these verses. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on them. We're going to do them in rapid succession. But the first is this. This first standard of giving is that we evaluate where there is need. Evaluate where there is need. Take a look at verse 15. In verse 15, Paul writes to the Philippians, he says, You Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me and giving and receiving except you only. Paul was a missionary who had one supporter, one church. Can you imagine today being a missionary, going out, and you only have one church that is committed to supplying your needs. The Philippian church evaluated where the need was. They saw Paul and they said, if we don't supply this guy, he's gonna fall flat on his face. The gospel will not go forth unless we give to Paul and that he can take the gospel to places that that it hasn't gone yet. And so they partnered with him and he was supplied and they were the only ones. Here in America, we have been blessed abundantly with immense ability to be able to give. But how well do we evaluate where the greatest need is? Where is the money going when we give it? I just want to share some statistics that I found with you this week on how American evangelicals give annually. Here's some statistics. Bear with me as I uh, lay out these numbers. You number people are going to love this. I hate this kind of thing. But here we go. American evangelicals, all together, every year, we make approximately $700 trillion. If you took all the income, all the money that American evangelicals get and put it in one pot, it would be approximately $700 trillion. Of that $700 trillion, we give $700 billion away annually. And that's just giving it away to all sorts of stuff, not particularly to Christian work. So $700 billion, of that $700 billion... 45 billion goes to missions. It's a pretty low number. Of that 45 billion, 700 billion goes to missions. Or, sorry, half of that 45 billion goes into missions within the U.S. So of all the money that we give to missions, half of it gets filtered back into the states and missions that are happening stateside. Here's where it gets interesting. Only 2 billion goes to non-evangelized places in the world. Out of that $45 billion, only $2 billion of it goes to non-evangelized places in the world. That is, that there are missionaries on the ground, there may even be a church, but the gospel by and large hasn't gone out yet. And then even more staggering, only $450 million goes to completely unreached people groups. That is just barely 0.1% of our missions giving annually goes to people who have no access to the gospel at all. No church, no Bible. Now that's a lot of numbers. I just want to illustrate it. Don Mills, you said I don't do illustrations enough, so this is for you, buddy. (laughs) All right? Here is the $700 billion in this pot, in this, what is this thing? Pitcher that we, that, that we give away Uh, annually. Half of this, this is U.S. missions here, half of this just goes right back in to the states, okay? So we got this much left. All this has just been poured right back in to America, which is fine. Um, Here, the rest is going to go to foreign missions, but how much do we give to places that really don't have much gospel exposure at all? Uh, Here's a tablespoon. That's how much. 
How about unreached people groups? People that literally have no access to the gospel at all. No one's, no one's there. No one's evangelizing. Here's a teaspoon. Can you see that? Do you think maybe there is a need to reevaluate where the greatest need is? How many generations of people in the 6,000 plus unreached people groups will live and die without hearing the name of Jesus Christ? And what if, what if we could just even it out a little bit? What could God do if we started giving more strategically to places where there is the greatest need? The greatest need. So number one, evaluate where there is the greatest need. Number two, standard of giving. Give not only occasionally, but habitually. Give not only occasionally, but habitually. Uh, note, notice in uh, verse 16. In verse 16, Paul writes, Even in Thessalonica you sent me help for my needs once and again. It wasn't just a one-time off for the Philippians. They wanted to give to Paul often. They wanted to supply him fully. They didn't just once, but once and again, and now here they are doing it again in Philippi. Oh, how easy it is in our minds and in our hearts when we hear of a need. And you ever have that moment in your mind where you say, well, you know, I supplied pretty generously in a need like six months ago, so I could kind of tick off that box. We'll, we'll pass this one by. We don't want to just give occasionally. We want to be people who are habitually giving. We need to cultivate a tithing habit, a giving habit to supply the work of the kingdom. Thirdly, in our standard of giving, we must value spiritual riches more than earthly riches. Value spiritual riches more than earthly riches. Take a look at verse 17. Verse 17, Paul writes, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. In other words, Paul's saying, I'm not worried about the money. I don't seek the money. What I do seek is this gospel fruit that will come from you supplying for my need. Because you've supplied, now the gospel is going to keep going out as I continue my ministry. And you're going to see spiritual fruit from this that's going to be to your credit, Philippians. You're joining in me and helping gospel fruit to go forward by giving uh, sacrificially as you have been. And I love what he says in verse 18. He says, I've received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. And notice what he calls their offering to him. A fragrant offering. A sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. When Paul was in his prison cell and he looked at that care package, whatever it was that the Philippians had given him, what he saw was, the, was a sacrifice to the Lord. The Lord was lending to him for his use in his work. We have to prize the spiritual riches that come through the giving of our earthly riches. If we don't prize spiritual fruit, if we don't want to see gospel fruit come, we're never, we're never gonna be willing to give away more and more of our, richly, of our earthly riches. And then lastly, affirm God's promise to honor your obedience. Affirm God's promise to honor your obedience. In verse 19, Paul wraps it up by saying, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. It's not name it and claim it. It's not if you give so much, God will do this for you. But he will supply every need. It may not be every want. It's not gonna make you a millionaire. He will, he will honor and reward an obedient servant. He will not overlook your faithfulness in giving. I remember when John Piper was at cross conference once uh, to a, a thousands upon thousands of young people uh, in their 20s who were choosing career paths and all sorts of stuff. He said, you have two options. Uh, one, stop going to school give up your hopes of a career and go give it all in some obscure country for the sake of the gospel. That's option number one. Option number two, do the best you can in school, 
get the best career that you possibly can and make the most money that you possibly can in order that you can give it all away. Those are your two options. And don't you think, friends, when we get to eternity and we see the glory and beauty of Jesus Christ, we look at that vast multitude that Jesus will call to himself to the end of the ages, we're not going to look at all that and then go, man, I really regret giving what I gave. I have a feeling I'm going to stand there in front of Jesus and that immense multitude, I'm going to say, man, I wish I gave more. Have you found no ultimate contentment in this world? Ground yourself in Jesus. He alone will satisfy. John G. Payton, with this we'll close. John G. Payton was a missionary uh, in the 1800s. That's an amazing beard. Hashtag goals right there. Um, He was a Scottish missionary. He, his wife, and his little infant boy decided from the inner calling of the Holy Spirit on their lives to go be missionaries to the unreached people group and the New Hebrides. The New Hebrides were made up of tribes that were cannibalistic. And John G. Payton and his wife counted the cost and they went. When they got there, only after three months in, his wife and his son both died of tropical fever. If you read his autobiography, there are gut-wrenching accounts of him after they died. Every night he would sleep with his arms around the tombstones, guarding them from the cannibals, digging them up to eat them. He just wept every night at the graveside of his wife and his kid. He didn't uh, treasure the thing. He didn't, he didn't have an abundance uh, in his mission to the New Hebrides. In fact, like Paul, he faced hunger and he faced desperate need. And it was only after 12 years of faithful ministry, 12 years among this tribe, that he even saw one convert. But because he was a man who was contented and satisfied in Jesus and was willing to give all he had to see Christ reign over the people of the New Hebrides, after 41 years, 41 years, of serving among the people of the New Hebrides. He built two orphanages, he built a school, he planted a church and started a medical clinic. And right before he died, he saw the day that every single person alive during his lifetime among the tribe came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, 100%. If you go to the New Hebrides today, the statistics are that 98% of the people there are evangelical Christians. Why? Because one man, John G. Payton, was willing to count the cost, was not in love with the things of this world, but was content in the Lord Jesus Christ. Through him who strengthened him, he went. And the Lord honored it. What will your story be? What is the legacy you will leave? Do your kids... Are they learning from you what it looks like to live a contented life in Christ? And what are you not willing to give that shows that maybe there's just a little much of the things of this world in you that still needs to be repented of, still needs to be sacrificed at the altar of God's glory? Let's be contented in Jesus. And then once we are, let's throw all we have at him. Amen? Let's pray. Father, you are so good to us that you would reveal to us the person of your son, the only one who can ultimately satisfy all the deepest longings in our lives. God, we confess that we are so discontent. We live from day to day looking around, seeing things that we don't have, that we don't need, and we get them anyway. Lord, help us to think um, more in line with spiritual wisdom than earthly wisdom. Help us to find our contentment not in this world, but in the world of eternity where Jesus lives and where he reigns and where we will live with him forever. 
Lord, the time is so short. We pray that we would give, give, give. That we'd be wise and strategic in the way that we're giving. We'd evaluate um, where we could give more in places where the need is greatest. And Lord, help us not to be occasional givers, but to give habitually and to believe you when you say that you will honor the one who obeys uh, all the commandments that you tell us to in terms of supplying for the Great Commission. Lord, we love you. We want more for our hearts to be settled and satisfied in you. Would you make that possible for us? We pray that you would uh, fill our hearts now as we sing praise to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.